have the pleasure of introducing Christopher X. Shade. He's the author of the novel, The Good Mother of Marseille. His stories, poems, and book reviews are reviewed widely. He's also co-founder and co-editor of the Kajubi, a journal of poetry and prose at kajubilit.com. He teaches poetry and prose, writing at the Writer's Studio. Raised in the South, he now lives and works in New York City. Please welcome Christopher Hello. 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 Poetry. I know you're all excited. <laughs> <laughs> this is all going to be Philip Larkin, very dark, depressing poetry. <laughs> no, it's not. <clears throat> Mary and Joseph noticed that Jesus had to pull things closer to see them. And so it went that in his fifth year, Jesus was given glasses. They were like the ones I had as a boy. They were enormous on his face. And no one told him how ridiculous he looked. This was how it was and is and always will be. And a little time passed, the time of children, the playtime that I did not know would mean so much, climbing trees, wandering dry creek beds, he was able to distinguish the donkey at pasture from the dog, and trees, the olive from the almond. And so it came to pass that his vision got worse. But this wasn't as important as food on the table and shoes. And so as he grew, he wore the glasses but could not see true. Time and again, as prophecy, he could not read transit signs and got turned around in New York City. <laughs> he missed buses, he missed appearances at peace rallies and birthdays at Rosa Mexicano. But who better knew, who better than this visionary, that to fall out of touch is to fall into peril. The subway brought him from way out in Queens to Soho, Tribeca, Nolita, and Noho, where I've seen him, yes, there, among shoppers who golf and own beach homes. I've seen him at the top of subway station stairs like a pickpocket of passports and souls, watching from behind enormous glasses, the blur of all people's passers-by. So this is my book, Shield the Joyous. Uh, it, it, uh, it's out. Well, it's, it has a pub date of April 2nd, and it, uh, it concerns largely the loss of loved ones to addiction. <coughs> I'm just going to read a few points. Not the scarlet ibis of James Hurst not in the tree of Christ, but an ordinary small bird, a finch, a sparrow, brown or gray, may stand or perch or light or sit or roost in an ordinary tree. In the third grade, I discourteously left Eva Shoemaker below while I climbed a rose of Sharon, then leaped to a low pecan branch to stand or perch or light or sit or roost, in the seventh grade, I was benumbed in the presence of certain girls like Vicki Cannon. Muted by schoolboy crush, whenever I saw her coming, I jumped into the nearest tree. There I looked around, pretending to make discoveries among inevitable paths of branches, each its own journey. I pretended she wasn't curiously bird-watching me. She bade me come down, I lowered myself, and having found a dead fat bug and a bird's feather, I handed her the feather. She blushed. Neither of us were capable of speech. For all I knew, for all I know, she has the ordinary feather of a finch 40 years later among her sacred keepsakes. I still have the bug. <laughs> Is not the one I was supposed to read. <laughs> I only have one hand. Uh, I'm sorry. Ten seconds. 
and looking for the armored vehicle. <coughs> The armored vehicle wakes up in the morning and doesn't know what it's in for. It makes coffee, clicks through headlines of the business section. The armored vehicle wakes up in the morning and doesn't stretch. It used to a great start the day stretch with arms up, tipping back, as if to pull itself off the ground, as if to say, ready, set. <clears throat> It only pisses, then shades, then goes to work, then comes home. It is safe, except from itself. No one with light weaponry can get at its bejeweled core, as suggests St. Teresa d'Avila. The armored vehicle does not think to go to the monastery for the weekend, but it admires the shape of frying eggs and snow falling outside on 10th Street of New York City, where at night there's no quiet. It has points of weakness like everyone else. Its wheels, its fuel stops. The armored vehicle does not think to pray. It gains weight, it loses weight. The armored vehicle double parks and gets no tickets. It keeps itself clean, its chrome and its white shine in the sun. The traffic cop absolves it of moving violations. It bellows along with songs on its radio to tune out other noise in its head. It wails of hanging from chandeliers and of one love. At quieter times, gurus come over the airwaves, suggesting it ought to love everyone. And so it tells itself it does, and that it means no harm. Who does it harm, after all? Who says anyone gets hurt? It is the armored vehicle, too proud for gurus. So there's a lot of mention of monastery in this book because, uh, because after I lost my baby brother to addiction on Christmas Day, I made a long series of retreats to a monastery up on the Hudson, and I basically wrote this book, and it's structured in uh, the, the structure of prayers at the monastery. And it's not an especially like spiritual journey book. It really is more grappling with uh, the loss of a loved one to addiction and, and um, how that touches so many of us and trying to understand what happened really. So there's just a, a wide variety of, of poems in the book. This is called Ambulance Rides, and this was in the North American Poetry Review. The ambulance idles at the curb, all lights off. Up from Roosevelt Avenue, between blocks of buildings, these two paramedics in the front seats drink coffee from paper cups. They pour from a thermos and try on each other's sunglasses. They knuckle roll coins and fold intravenous tubing into imaginary pets. These two, on a recent night shift, pulled a college kid out from under an F train. She'd been seen for hours in Washington Square, tossing bowling pins up in the air. Trying to learn to catch them, she'd dropped herself in front of the F at 14th Street a day shift today. These two turn up the radio and sing jazz splashing onto the sidewalk while they can between calls. Between summons to aid the men in cardiac arrest and the seizing teenage girls. And last week, the woman who'd stood at a window for days staring at the wall, she was parched, soiled, translucent, and she fell into their arms, lost dead. These days, these two lays in their seats, play I spy or somebody will die, or they don't, while they wait for what's next, while the wind outside the truck whips up cigar wrappers and lottery slips. These two, one of them sleeps face on the window and snores gentle coughs while the other pulls watercolors out from under her seat and paints round, full, wet circles of faces. 
I want to read one more from the book because this is a writer studio group. And one thing that we do is we're always looking at the storyteller of a poem or a piece of prose, fiction or memoir. And um, so uh, you can see that I was inspired, you know, in yoga, they say, take your yoga off the mat into real life off the mat. And uh, so um, this is taking that concept of a storyteller and a piece uh, to, um, to how could I have best been in service in a relationship with my baby brother? <clears throat> if I can find the point. <clears throat> um. <clears throat> to us should have been the holes, but we never thought to see who was who at the time, the poets, the biologists of language, the priests of play and dove, magic tricks, the likes of Patti Smith, David Bowie reading Dostoevsky, Solzhenitsyn, and Chekhov, along with James Wright, Cortazar, Camus, with cathedrals of Carver, lost happily, with Allen Ginsberg, his fury of bliss, his fright of a far-flung consciousness, and Ferlinghetti, his Coney Island of my tribe, marching ahead of all of us with pills and booze leading us into the night. So I want to read a poem that uh, is just something not in the book, but something I've been working on. It's called My Massage Therapist. My Massage Therapist Smokes. <laughs> he whispers obscenities, and I think he's not aware that he's doing this. On my way, the taxi driver has one eye and a lead foot. We are blind to how we ought to be. At Grace Church, children are teeming over the playground, while in the chantry, adult children of alcoholics beg themselves to forgive themselves in a funhouse of mirrors and distortion and despair. They suggest serenity under the same cross as seen at the monastery on the Hudson. It's most unusual. We are numb from pain and ache so terribly. No one would come to my massage therapist if he admitted to puncturing his patients with needles. It thrills him to do it. Ancient medicine, he says, serenity. Thank you all, and thank you for inviting me, Andrea. Thank you for the great <laughs>